Okay, so the big thing I wanted to impress upon you guys when I'm talking about pulse oximeters, you know, a lot of monitors can be inaccurate and, and it, it takes experience to figure out, is this really a reading that I should be worried about? And especially with pulse oximeters, there's lots of things that can get in the way. Um, you know, like I said, the probe is dirty and, or it's dry, you know, so sometimes it's as simple as replacing the probe. And so I mean, you really should go through that checklist and I want you to be familiar with, and this is the other thing. If I told you, um, okay, Rachel, I'll look at that. But um, if I tell you, if you tell me on a test, like what's a reason for a low pulse oximeter, like probe fell off, how do you fix that? You put the probe on. Um, inadequate oxygenation, you know, bag the patient. So for every time you speak of a problem, I want you to be familiar with something that you should do to fix the problem, or what are you gonna do about it? It's, I think you need to go beyond just telling the doctor, hey, it's a bad reading. What have you done stepwise, or what can you do? Um, and again, just a reminder, and you know, for those of you that are working somewhere, you can't just magically turn up the oxygen and it's gonna fix the problem. A lot of times ventilation has to be added to, you know, if an animal's not breathing, if you turn up the oxygen, it doesn't do anything if they're not breathing it in, or especially if they're not breathing adequately. You know, that's one of the reasons we give them a breath is because they're hypoventilating. So some of the reasons here is incorrect use, but let me also bring up, since you guys are gonna be starting to sedate patients um, this week, when you guys use Dextomator, Dextomator is a very potent vasoconstrictor. So all the peripheral vessels including those in the mouth, are constricted. So they're gonna look pale, and sometimes you're gonna get an inadequate reading, and that's due to the vasoconstriction. So I wouldn't be surprised if you find that your animals are pale, um, or you have trouble with your pulse oximeter. So it, you could find um, that it's a little more difficult, especially because um, of the drugs. So, Obviously, if you don't have good tissue perfusion, which if you have a really bad blood pressure, that can affect your reading. Um, the other thing is inadequate oxygen delivery. Now, your animals in radiology aren't going to be on oxygen. Um, but if you have a patient under general anesthesia getting oxygen, is there, did you run out of oxygen? Is something hooked up improperly? Um, and the way you check this is you, you, you check your sores, you check your tubing, but you can bag your patient. And if you bag your patient, that kind of leads to this next one, inadequate ventilation. If a patient's not breathing deep enough and they're not taking in the oxygen, the way you fix that is you assist them. You breathe more often for them. At minimum, I breathe for my patients every three to five minutes. It, they could be beautifully ventilating themselves. Regardless, they're all hypoventilating when they're anesthetized. So that's, but that's what's called a sigh breath and that just helps supplement. And then the other thing is you do, do you have inadequate circulation, which is going back to maybe a cardiac arrhythmia, potentially a blood pressure issue, which is impairing blood flow. So be familiar for the test, especially how to troubleshoot. And if you tell me a problem, how do you fix the problem you identified? Um, now, now, again, when I talk about SpO2, it's an indicator of oxygenation. It can come from a ventilation issue, but it's SpO2 is not monitoring ventilation. It's monitoring oxygenation because you can have SpO2 problems that are not a ventilation issue. If they have a crappy blood pressure and you get a crappy SpO2 reading, that has nothing to do with ventilation. That's circulation that's perfusion. They could be breathing beautifully, but the body can't circulate the oxygen that they're breathing beautifully, if that makes sense. So you have to separate oxygenation from ventilation. Yes, they hopefully go together. If you have an animal that's ventilating well, hopefully they're oxygenating well, but that's not always the case. So what are indicators of ventilation? Well, let's, we're going to talk about how we're going to look at this. Now, the difference in the terminology is obviously ventilation 
is actually moving the air in and out of the alveoli. If you remember, those are the little air sacs in the lungs. That's where the oxygen has to get to. to now, when the oxygen diffuses into the capillary, that's respiration. If you remember, there's internal respiration and that's what happens at the capillary. That's when oxygen diffuses into the blood and carbon dioxide diffuses out to be exhaled. Okay, so how do we monitor? Um, number one is you're gonna look at your respiratory rate. How many breaths per minute um, are they breathing? Now, I want you guys, a number that you should burn into your head, especially because you're gonna be sedating, I do not like them lower than six breaths a minute. I mean, eight is pretty low, but I've had plenty of anesthetized sedated patients that breathe eight times a minute. If I watch my dogs when they sleep, they're probably about six to eight times a minute when they're sleeping. So that gives you an indicator. But six is kind of like my comfort cutoff. Um, you know, and then I have to remember, guys, if you get a reading that you don't like, how are you going to back that up? You're going to look at your heart rate. You're going to feel a pulse. You're going to look at their jaw tone. You're going to look at their eye position. You're going to like try to say, you know, is the respiratory rate the only problem? Heart rate's great, color's great, you know, eye position's good, blinking, no blink, you know, pinch the toe. These are all ways to assess when you get a crappy number, I gotta back it up with other data. Um, now you can watch them move their chest. On your last test, I said, do you have to have a stethoscope to get a respiratory rate? And the answer was false. You do not. You can literally watch them breathe. Now, you do want to assess lung sounds. So it is good to have a stethoscope and listen to make sure everything sounds good. But if you're just getting a respiratory rate, when you guys are in surgery, you're usually going to be watching your breathing bag. You can count. Uh, sometimes you can watch fogging in the tube. You can watch the drapes move. You can put your hand on their chest and feel it raise. So there's various ways to get your respiratory rate. Um, you guys are all fine that are bopping in. So um, now obviously you're going to have a mechanical monitor um, is going to be your capnograph, which is your end tidal CO2 monitor. It does give you a respiratory rate. It is usually fairly accurate. Um, but I always tell students, I prefer the values that you write down on your anesthesia record as something you observe. Because again, anything mechanically can have issues, anything can fail. But what you listen is the actual animal, so that's going to always be the most accurate. And again, it'll be decreased. You know, most cats are upwards of 20, 30 breaths a minute. Dogs can be anywhere from like, eight to 12 or eight to 20, you know, the littler dogs are gonna be faster, the bigger dogs are gonna be slower. Um, that's just nature and cats tend to be, you know, the one I helped with the other day was breathing about 30, 40 times a minute during surgery. So they're always usually a little more uh, rapid. Um, now, what happens when we see a value out of normal range? Well, tachypnea, which is a rapid respiratory rate. You know, just like tachycardia, it's a high heart rate. Tachypnea is a fast heart rate. Now, reasons that that can happen. Um, now, hypercapnia, which I haven't gotten into, is a high, capna, C-A-P-N is always CO2. So hypercapnia is an elevated end tidal CO2. Now, if you guys remember from respiratory physiology, when an animal has a high CO2, that should trigger the brain to breathe more to get rid of it. That's how you get rid of CO2. So sometimes an animal has an increase in their respiratory rate because the body's trying to get rid of CO2. It's a natural reaction. Now, anesthesia diminishes that ability um, to react to CO2. It diminishes the brain's sensitivity to it. So sometimes animals Aren't a, that's why sometimes animals have high CO2 during anesthesia. It's because CNS system is depressed. The body's ability to react to elevating CO2 is diminished. So therefore, and that's different from different drugs. Drugs are respiratory depressants. 
um, and drugs alter the, the body's natural ability. You know, I told you guys in anatomy, I said, when you guys are sitting there breathing shallow and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, you go, you take this sigh breath. It's because you've been breathing shallow and your CO2 is going up. And then all of a sudden your brain goes, I got to take a deep breath and get rid of it. Well, anesthesia diminishes that reaction. So that's why we give them a sigh breath because they, um, that ability to do that is diminished. Um, now also surgical stimulus, a lot of times when Dr. Uh, Paul is like, if he's clamping the testicle or he's pulling out the ovary, um, a lot of times there's parts in a procedure where animals will always pant. When I used to help in, uh, when we did our stifle surgeries, whenever the doctor would cut into the joint capsule, I can have a beautifully deep patient. They go to cut in the joint capsule and the dog would huff and puff. And as soon as they got through the capsule, the dog would go back to normal. So sometimes there's mild surgical stimulus that'll cause their respiratory rate to go up. Um, <clears throat> and a lot of times, if the animal is starting to become tachypnic, maybe you just turn them down. I, I always tell students, try to run the lowest amount of gas you possibly can without them feeling anything. But say you turn them down, and then all of a sudden their respiratory rate's going 12, 18, 22, 24, 36, it's going up and they're, you know, especially if it's getting deeper, they may be getting to feel something, you may have to turn them back up. Um, so you have to look at your CO2, you have to look at your other parameters. Um, now, tidal volume is something, if you remember, tidal volume is the amount of air an animal moves in one breath, in milliliters. Um, <laughs> Madison, hopefully they appreciate. <laughs> I, I apologize if I've created some. <laughs> yeah, tell him I'm sorry I've told you too many EKG horror stories, but he should be happy that you are going to be on top of it because you're on that listening, right? <laughs> oh, you guys will appreciate it. I can't wait to guys do your first anesthesia. It would be great. Um, now, when we monitor, oh goodness, I bet that was not fun. Three hour, yikey. Foreign body in a bowel resection. They do okay, the patient do okay? Ah, oh, he wanted to stop breathing. Do you think he was deep? He did great though. You know, and, and, and something relating to what you said, Madison, and, and I don't know if the patient did this. Sometimes, and this leads into exactly what we're talking about. Sometimes an animal will, will breathe very fast, like a bunch in a row. And sometimes when they breathe a bunch, they'll stop breathing for a while. And what happens is, they get rid of a bunch of CO2, then they don't have a stimulus to breathe because they breathe a bunch in a row and then the CO2 goes low. Well, the CO2 is the stimulus to breathe. So sometimes I have patients, they'll hyperventilate themselves and then all of a sudden they'll stop breathing for like, uh, yes, and Madison, and this is a perfect example. These patients go on this like, I call it like roller coaster breathing. It's like a bunch in a row and then they stop and it gives you massive anxiety and then you breathe for them. Naturally, CO2 goes up, they start breathing again and then they stop and it's kind of like, <coughs> there are some patients that do that. And turning down the ISO, you know, I'll give you guys a goal because I know some of you are working in practice and I worked with a criticalist and his goal was he never wanted the ISO above 2%. He said, if I had to run more than 2%, we needed to give some more like hydro or morphine or fentanyl or butorf, whatever pain med I was using. Because he said, if you're having to go higher than 2%, they're probably feeling something. Like ideally 2% or lower, we should be able to maintain them. Now I've had to have patients up at three, maybe three and a half percent. I don't like to do that. I think that's just too much. 
usually I try to ask my doctor and say, can I give him something for pain? You can give them IV morphine or IV hydro or give them, an, you know, because a lot of times they get something in the pre-med, they get a, like a morphine pre-med. Sometimes it's not enough and it doesn't last into surgery. So sometimes we have to top them off. We have to give them another injection in the OR, especially if I feel like I have to keep them, if I keep creeping them up, then usually my doctor was like, let's give them something. I was like, okay. So yeah. And you know, in some cases, you know, there's always been surgeries where I'm just like, I want to be done with this surgery because I feel like I'm a yo-yo with my patient and I just can't get them in like a, a good, and sometimes it's their condition. Uh, and sometimes it's their response. You know, that's a pretty sick dog. Sounds like, um, you know, a bowel resection foreign body, uh, is a pretty intensive surgery, um, can be, you know, especially if they've got toxemia or, you know, hopefully it wasn't ruptured. I'm assuming it wasn't ruptured. No, sorry. I was typing because my dogs were going at it, but, um, <laughs> uh, he did great. We had him at three a majority of the time when we sedated him initially, we gave him propofol and he was fighting it really hard. And then about halfway through, we gave him some IM buprenorphine. Okay. But we good. had him at three a majority of the time. Cause if not, he would start kind of like twitching his lips. Yeah. And you know, there are some patients that just, and their level of pain is, and you know, buprenorphine is, I don't know if you guys have hydro or, you know, fentanyl. Um, some, you know, sometimes a doctor preference, sometimes, you know, a doctor just likes one drug and they prefer that. Yeah. And it may just be, you know, and like I said, it's, and I give you guys that guidance as a kind of like a general, but you know, I'm, I always have patients where, and it's, it's my doctor. I follow my doctor's orders, you know, um, if, if I need to keep turning them up, you know, I, I will. So that was good to give some buprenorphine or, you know, but it sounds like you were on that ventilation roller coaster that sometimes happens. Yeah. Is that, is that just something that happens or is there anything that you can do to like encourage them to continue breathing? <laughs> well, you know, what's interesting is I think that could have been a little bit related to pain mm -hmm. and, but you know, buprenorphine may have been helping, but it's not like a super high, you know, pain, bu butorphone and buprenorphine are moderate analgesics. Your hydromorphone is much of a, is a much heavy hitter. Um, yeah. And maybe he was just feeling slight levels of pain. So he would like, <laughs> and then stop. And then now you could, I don't know if you guys have a ventilator, you can control, ventilate the dog, like take over and put them on a ventilator or breathe more often for them. Well, did you guys have CO2? Do you guys have a CO2 monitor? Yes. Did he have like high CO2? Do you remember? I don't. Um, no, his CO2 level was, it was still within range. Yeah. And, 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 and he may have just been like, I wonder if it was just his condition and pain, you know, intestinal pain is yikey. Yeah. Because <laughs> we ended up resecting, I think it was about four feet worth wow. of small intestine. Wow. That poor dude. But I got a hand. I got, I want to show you the thing. <laughs> You what? <laughs> I want to show you something. I have to keep it in my closet so my dogs don't get into it, but. Oh, what is it? I can't hardly tell. Is it's it a not... piece of the intestine. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, I need a little uh, souvenir of that. <laughs> I got to keep it. It was my first bowel section. I'm like, can I keep a piece? <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. We all get collections. See, you guys all develop collections over the years. <laughs> Very so cool. So just so you know, you were the little voice in the back of my head the whole three hours yesterday. <laughs> I hope it was a good voice. You're just at it the was. beginning. It was. Okay. Well, I hope your doctor is probably like, oh, God, what has this teacher told her? But... <laughs> Well, no, because he didn't know about, you know, that the EKG keeps reading even after death. He was like, oh, really? I'm like, yeah. It's very, he would, yeah. He would stop breathing 
and then I'd have to manually breathe for him so that I would check his heart rate and make sure that, that it was still going. And he's yeah. like, what are you doing? <laughs> because I've never had a patient like that roller coaster breathing before. Yeah. They were kind of a pain in the butt. And sometimes, you know, sometimes you just have a patient, they're really sensitive. And, and I'm guessing with the bowel pain, it may have just been, you know, you can do the best you can. And with buprenorphine, you can only reach a level. Maybe he just was a little sensitive. So, you know, it sounds like you're on top of it, you know, making sure that heart rate. So I'm glad it, it went well. I'm glad. I'm going to hope some of it will stick. I hope so. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> yeah. It's good experience for you guys to get all this, you know, you can hopefully apply something. So very cool. Well, very <laughs> cool with the enjoy your intestines. So, <laughs> <laughs> oh God, oh, I'm like, it'll be, it's, it's, I'm sure it was pretty dark intestine. Um, it was more purple in color than the red. Ooh, not good. Not good. No. Purple intestine. Not good. Yeah. I'm doing GI right now with anatomy, so I was going to show them that stomach foreign body surgery I showed you guys with the Shih Tzu, and they pull, they get to watch that today, and then I found a picture of, like, these twisted, dilated intestines that are purple, and I'm like, oh, that's so bad, so, yeah. Well, Hope Pup is doing good, so. <laughs> He's doing good. He's back in the hospital for IV fluids and medications today. Good, good. Well, keep me posted, so. I will. Very cool, very cool. Um. This is one value that mentoring title volume, I can't, you're not really, there is a machine called a respirometer. I've never even used one. We didn't have one even at Purdue. So when you guys monitor this, it's just subjective, but it's just how deep are they breathing? You know, how much air are they taking in and out? So um, you watch the chest, you can watch the bag. Obviously, if the bag is barely moving, they're not taking in a lot, the deeper they breathe, the more tidal volume. Um, but I want to talk about, you know, when, when they hypoventilate or they're not breathing very deep, um, it's just shallow breathing. Okay. Hypoventilation um, is not really like, I'm going to give you an example. I helped with a black cat the other day. We spayed it. I was in there in surgery. Um, and she was just taking these tiny little breaths. Now she was breathing like 40 times a minute, but I, she was hypoventilating. She was just like, and sometimes little cats do that. And the thing I worry about, and I want you guys to know this word is atelectasis, and that's areas of collapsed alveoli. Now, if you have a whole lung collapsed, you know, if you guys remember, when an animal inhales and exhales, they don't completely exhale where their lung closes like a pancake. There's always a little bit of volume left. So now, if a, if a lung is not being ventilated, it can start to, to collapse, you know, and this is one of the reasons I say you should breathe for them, is you squeeze the bag because the more shallow, they're not squeezing open those alveoli and you want to really inflate them so you know gentle bagging um, we talk about that when we talk about machines now if you have hyperventilation which may be the case like Madison was talking about where they're kind of breathing now there is a difference between hyperventilation and what I call tachypnea um, tachypnea is a fast respiratory rate, but it can be more shallow. Hyperventilation is a fast respiratory rate, but it's also very deep. <sighs> you know, like if they say you go run and you've never run before, or, you know, and you just like, you just can't get enough air, you're hyperventilating. But if you've ever, sometimes they're just breathing very fast and very shallow. You know, tachypnea and panting, are, you know, kind of close together. When an animal's panting, they're kind of like, you know, they're fast, but they're not like, <sighs> so there's a difference. Now, what happens when they hyperventilate? Well, again, the big things I look for, they can have a high CO2 or surgical stimulation, you know, like during a surgery, like where they're clamping something or cutting into something. Um, you know, it's, it's always a stressful part when you're the anesthetist, the doctor comes in to start and they make the first cut. That's when you really find out you're like, they should be asleep. 
let's hope they don't start, you know, right when they start cutting. A big thing that I, I preach is character. That really tells me, you know, a number is great to know. I love to know what, how many times they're breathing a minute. How are they breathing? What is the character? Remember, this is when I got into that IE ratio of a one to two, one to three. <sighs> a nice relaxed breathing. Uh, but this is the effort. And this is really by watching the chest. Sometimes you can see it in the bag, but you really have to try to look at their chest and, and kind of get look, uh, look at their abdomen. Um, but this is the relationship to the IE. This inspiration to expiration is a one to two, one to three time ratio. Inspiration should be shorter than expiration or exhalation. Now, you can listen to the chest, and obviously you're going to be listening for any, like, you know, crackles, anything that's harsh that doesn't sound like a nice, clean respiratory sound. And if you notice dyspnea, which is labored or difficulty breathing, it really needs to be investigated, especially under anesthesia, because they're intubated, so you have an open airway, they're getting 100% oxygen. So dyspnea under anesthesia can be significant. And remember, I just some of the stuff I talked to you about on SpO2, check your endotracheal tube. Remember, put your hand in front of the, you know, disconnect them, put your hand in front of the endotracheal tube. Do you feel air moving? If I, and like I said, that case I had at Purdue where the dog was like gasping for air turning blue and the bag got really huge and the dog was like, I mean, gasping, the fastest thing that I did was disconnect the animal from the machine. And that told me right away, it wasn't a machine problem because it didn't fix the dog's breathing. So I can't, you could spend 10 minutes troubleshooting your machine and then meanwhile, your patient's still blue, but I disconnected them, it didn't fix the problem. So then I was like, it's a problem inside the dog. And the first thing I checked was my tube and I could feel no air moving. So I'm like, there's a blockage because the dog is moving his abdomen and I don't feel anything, something's blocked. So that's kind of working the problem. Um, I wanna talk about something called epneustic respiratory pattern. So you guys, apnea is no breathing. If your patient is apneic, they're not breathing. But there's something called apneustic breathing. And it is a pause when they inhale. So they tend to it's kind of like they, they're holding their breath. They inhale and they hold their breath. Now, when you look at them, you see pauses. So it looks like they're apneic, but it's because they can have this holding. I tend to see this apneustic breathing when on ketamine protocols. Ketamine can cause this. So if you're using Ketval in your practice, um, you guys will use Kitty Magic um, when you guys are in surgery and that contains ketamine. So sometimes these cats and there's an interesting thing about ketamine. Ketamine, they retain a little bit of their swallow reflex. And my theory is these dogs feel, can sometimes maybe feel the tube, and it's kind of like they're holding their breath because they don't quite know how to breathe through the tube. Like they're, it feels strange. So sometimes I just move the tube a little bit or I like massage their throat. And sometimes I tickle their ribs and I get them to kind of breathe through it. Eventually when the gas kicks in, this will go away. This is usually just a transitory pattern. It doesn't usually stay the entire surgery. Once the inhalant kicks in, you'll see them get on this respiratory pattern. Now, apnea is when they literally have not taken a breath for a period of time. Now, for some, you know, like what I was saying with Madison, that case, if he breathed a bunch of times in a row and his CO2 came down and then all of a sudden he doesn't breathe, he's apneic for a period of time. Probably that CO2 had to come back up and then he'd start doing it again. And like I said, sometimes they just do that the whole surgery. Or um, if you guys 
um, I'll talk about propofol. Propofol is an extremely common induction agent, um, but it causes apnea after administration. It's extremely common. Um, it usually only lasts three to five minutes. Um, and if you give too much or too fast, the apnea is worse. So, you know, that's why when I talk about propofol, we have to give it real steady, like over 30, 60 seconds. We give like half of the dose and wait. But if you blast it in too fast, they're going to stop breathing. Now, this is a key, okay? If you have an apneic patient, how do I know they're not stopping breathing because they're about to die versus I'm just stopping breathing because I'm apneic for another reason. Whenever I have apnea, I look at my, my vitals. You know, if it's propofol related, they have good color. They have, you know, maybe a little jaw tone. Maybe they have a good pulse and a good heart rate and their, posi their eye position's good. If it's apnea because I'm about ready to die, they're probably like central eye position, lack of jaw tone, heart rates plummeted, can't feel a good pulse. Do you see where I'm getting at? You know, so think of a fork in the road. If I'm apneic, there's a couple different, there's reasons for apnea. And you guys will encounter it quite a bit with propofol and, and, and it's transient and it's really not much to worry about. What do I do? I have a tube in their throat. I squeeze the bag and I breathe for them. And then when the drug wears off in about five minutes, they start breathing. It's not a big deal. You know, when we induced that patient I had with the students at Purdue and it was way too deep and it had loose jaw tone, a heart rate of 30, you know, wasn't really breathing. I turned the dog off. We got atropine. We pushed fluids. We woke the dog up. So you see, I had two forks in the road my dog at Purdue, his vitals were very concerning. And I was like, we're impending cardiac arrest versus I just gave propofol maybe a little too much or a little too fast and it's going to go away. So we'll talk about that more. Now, there is an apnea monitor. I don't, <coughs> I've not used these, um, but it goes, so here's the endotracheal tube in the mouth. Here's the breathing system. In this red circle, there's a little adapter that goes in between. So what it does is as the animal breathes in and out, it detects that change in the humidity. It detects the breath. And then what happens here is you can set it, like this is set at 10. So if this dog's respiratory rate drops below 10 breaths a minute, it will alarm. It's not going to beep every time the dog takes a breath. It's only going to yell at you if they're not breathing. So, you know, but again, you may have this at a practice, but this is what I hope you have. It is probably, if I had to go into anesthesia and on a case and they said, you can have one monitor, you can only have one, what would you have? I'd have a capnograph. Um, and this tells you a lot that I'll, okay. First of all, it's an end tidal carbon dioxide monitor. ETCO2 is the abbreviation. End tidal is, it's measuring the CO2 at the end of a breath, tidal volume, end tidal CO2. So when they exhale at maximum exhalation, it will measure how much CO2 is being exhaled. Um, it will also tell you how much they're inhaling. So, you know, the, the main reason you're using this is obviously what are they exhaling? Is it normal? But again, we don't want them inhaling CO2. So it's going to tell us what they're inhaling. Um, and it is very closely related. When they've tested these monitors, they've also done arterial C. Remember PA stands for partial pressure? of CO2 in arterial blood. So if you did a PaCO2 and you got an end tidal CO2, you know, a perfect teacher question, if I was giving a test, is like, what do you, where, how do you get a PaCO2? You draw an arterial sample. How do you get an NETCO2? It's from an exhaled sample. So, but the values are very close. So it's, it's pretty accurate. Um, it also will give you a respiratory rate. 
So the other thing the monitor will do, let me talk about the difference here. So here's a capnograph, okay? So it's an adapter just like the, uh, uh, the, the last picture we showed you. It goes, this is the breathing system, this blue, this squiggly tube. You got the endotracheal tube and then you've got this piece and there's a clear tube that goes into the monitor. And what you're looking at on this picture, I'm kind of highlighting with my little arrow, is zero is the bottom. So, and then you can set the top line. I think that looks like it's set to 50. So you can see when they're exhaling is at the top of this mountain. Think of it like a mountain. When they're inhaling, it should be at the bottom, right? Because we want it at zero. And then when they exhale, it goes to the top. And then when they inhale again, do you see how it's going flat? they're probably getting ready to take another breath. Um, if we look at these numbers, it can tell you 38 is the end tidal CO2, right? Um, it should be, it's not, they're usually on here somewhere, it'll have your inspired or your inhaled CO2. And then there's your respiratory rate. So this dog is breathing 10 times a minute, and has a CO end tidal CO2 of 38. Now, when we look, let me see. This is called a side stream capnograph because this, this stream comes out the side. A mainstream capnograph would be this large bulky thing that goes in between and it would measure in the mainstream. It would measure right at the tubing. Uh, side stream is less expensive. I've only ever worked with side stream. I think mainstream capnographs are kind of bulky and they add a lot of extra dead space. A lot of air has to be moved. So I prefer the side stream capnographs. That's the only difference is where is the sample being measured? Side stream is going to the machine. Mainstream capnography is measuring right at the exhalation point. So when you look at carbon dioxide, it should be a rectangle. Um, I'm gonna post a source. Um, there is a picture and it shows you different capnograph tracings because there's different patterns on a capnograph that mean different things. A main, I want you to know a normal capnograph is rectangle. It's a normal, so it's kind of like zero. When they exhale, it kind of goes up, it's kind of flat, and then it starts to go down. And it repeats every time they take a breath. Inhalation should be zero to two. It can be zero to two, but generally, you really don't want them inhaling CO2. They're supposed to be inhaling oxygen. Um, your exhaled or expiration is 35 to 45. I told you absolute is 40, but if I have a, if I have a dog that's between 35 and 45 for the surgery, I'm happy. I'm like, that's a dog that's staying in the normal range. And some dogs will breathe well and stay in that range the whole surgery. Sometimes they'll be too high. Um, it should, as soon as they go to inhale, it should go right to baseline. It should go right back to zero because they're inhaling, should be no CO2. Um, and this is basically showing you what's happening. So here's what a tracing looks like, okay, a drawing. So oxygen going in, CO2 going out, they're showing you at inside an alveoli, CO2 is going in, O2 to the blood. A is when they start their exhalation. When they get all the way up to, now B is some of the gas, dead space gas is what's, what's in the tubing. By the time you get to C and D, this should be what's come from the alveoli. But if you think about when they're breathing, there is a little bit of air right here in the tubing. So when they first begin to exhale, that's why they said B, is that dead space gas. And that's, dead space gas is what's coming from the tubing, that's just sitting in the tubing. When you get to C and D, you have alveolar gas. And when you're at D and it starts to drop, that's the start of inhalation. And E 
is when it's completely diluted out because they've pulled in fresh gas from the machine. So that's just showing you, you know, where everything's coming from. Now, abnormal CO2, you know, the first thing I think about is it, you know, it's a predictor or it's an interpretation of ventilation. So you have to look at what is your baseline, which I said is zero. Um, what is your end tidal CO2 number? Is it the 35 to 45? Um, is the shape a normal uh, shape? Is it a normal CO2 wave? And then what is, how often is it changing? So what you tend to see, and this is a very good, um, you know, when they hyperventilate, you start to see a higher CO2. It's kind of like what comes first, chicken or the egg. Normally what happens is the CO2 is, creep, is creeping up or is high, then they begin to hyperventilate because if they hyperventilate for a period, they usually bring their CO2 down. So normally what happens is CO2 goes up, which causes them to hyperventilate. Then hypoventilation is you're getting a low CO2. Um, my cat in surgery the other day, that little black cat, I was getting CO2s of like 22, which is low. Now, I wasn't, I was not really even ventilating the cat that much. So I knew it wasn't, I was not over ventilating the cat. I, the cat was breathing very shallow. I wondered if that was accurate, if it was breathing enough to get a good CO2 reading. So that was the issue. Now, if you have a flat line, now, you know, when you, when you have a flat line in ECG, you better make sure the heart's beating just like Madison was saying, it's like, can you hear the heart? Can you hear the heart? Okay, why is it a flat line? Now, on a, on a capnograph, the animal's not breathing, so it will not have a tracing, so you'll have no uh, rectangle, no movement. Your respiratory rate will probably say zero. Now, it can be that they haven't, they're not breathing at that moment. Um, it can be that the CO2 isn't, like if the animal's breathing and it's flatlined, then it's a mouse, it's not getting to the machine. The, the tubing, I had some tubing that cracked and it had a hole in it. Um, and then I think when the animal's breathing, it was all going out that hole, it wasn't making it to the machine. As soon as I replaced the tubing, I had a reading. So that was a mouse, you know, obviously if your animal's going like this and there's nothing, that's probably a tracing issue. A tubing. Um, now, for some reason, if the bottom, if that baseline is elevated, the patient is rebreathing carbon dioxide. It could be a sensor problem. But you know, what if someone forgot to change the soda line? What if you know the little in the in the anesthetic machine? There's a canister, and it looks like they have little white rocks. Those little white rocks, that canister, when an animal exhales it removes CO2 from the exhaled gases because a machine reuses their gases, but it takes out the CO2. Well, if you don't change the soda line, it doesn't remove the CO2, they can re-inhale it. And sometimes that's why you have an elevation because they're rebreathing uh, CO2. Sometimes if the edges are rounded instead of a nice flat here, they have a leak. So it can be that they have a leaky cuff. Um, one thing I do want to talk about um, just real briefly, now hyperthermia, they tend to have a more elevated CO2. When they're hypothermic, they tend to have lower CO2. Um, if all of the sudden your CO2 is like, is, is very much declining, like your triangle is getting shorter and shorter, or your rectangle, sorry. Um, you can have a massive hypotension and you're not getting circulation to the lungs. If you think about it, is the circulation has to bring CO2 from the body back to the lungs. So if, if the animal's exhaling CO2, you have circulation. Um, I had a scary case, um, and I haven't lost a lot of dogs under anesthesia, and I've just been grateful, um, but I was anesthetizing this English bulldog, brain tumor, heart murmur, had heart disease, he was in bad shape, um, he, and 
it was his last day of anesthesia and he got five days in a row of radiation. I gave the propofol. I'd been, I've done it four times earlier this week. I gave the propofol. I intubate, fill my cuff, hook him up. And the monitor's already on and I have the CO2 hooked up. And I go to give the dog a breath and I look at my CO2 monitor and I have no tracing. I immediately turned off the gas, felt his heart and called my doctor because I was like, I know my tube is in. I just gave him a breath. I should have CO2. He had gone into cardiac arrest right after the propofol and died. And the reason I picked up on it so quickly was when I went to give a breath, I had no tracing. And I immediately felt, you know, well, I went to bag and the girl that was helping me, I was like, listen to his heart. And she's like, I can't hear anything. We couldn't feel a pulse. And, but I knew in my gut, I was like, and my boss is like, you know, he was very sick and we did nothing wrong. I mean, it was just, she's like, he must just have had a fate, like a heart attack or a fatal arrhythmia right at induction. But it happened like that. But the CO2 monitor picked it up because there was no circulation to the lungs. I should have had a tracing. So CPR or end tidal CO2 is, is a wonderful tool in cardiac arrest. If you hook it up while you're doing CPR and you start to get a CO2 tracing, it can be an indicator you're getting circulation, that you're successful. So it's a sensitive tool. I just wanted to make that last little tip. Now, could the CO2 monitor just not picked it up? But I knew that I checked the machine and everything was working before I induced the dog. So I knew in my heart it wasn't a machine problem. I was like, I think this is a dog problem. So sad day. So anyway, um, let me stop there. Um, do you have any questions?